it's fast. How are we gonna get to the top? I have an idea. The lat forming in this game is so lame. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is a time-honored and cherished children's story penned in 1865 by Reverend Charles Ludwig Dodson, better known by his pen name, Lewis Carroll. Carroll's tale about a little girl falling into a fantasy world filled with wacky characters and cringe-worthy wordplay is beloved by many, so it's no surprise to see it's withstood the passage of time. Made in the movies, TV shows, and video games throughout the years, it's only slightly surprising to see Alice's Adventures adapted into a Metroidvania. Alice Escaped, to put it lightly, is an oddity. It certainly takes influence from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland's setting and characters, but this isn't a tale about Alice's struggles at understanding an unfamiliar world governed by absurd rules. This tale is about what would happen if Alice lost that struggle against trying to make sense of her new reality and fell deeper into the rabbit hole of delusion and escapism. This is where our heroes Usada and Kotra come in. They discover a mysterious book at their public library, find a note that reads, Find Alice, and then get sucked into Wonderland. Who's Alice, why does she need found, and why is this creepy book kidnapping little girls? I guess you'll have to play to find out. Or just wait for the spoiler section of this video. I won't judge. But as Metroidvania enthusiasts, you might be asking yourself, should I play Alice Escaped? And I get it. You're probably looking at its sugary, kawaii aesthetics and worrying if playing it will put you at risk of getting type 2 diabetes, or worse, placed in some database run by the FBI. It's a real concern. But what if I told you that maybe beneath its sickeningly bright and girly chibi veneer, there's a decent Metroidvania with an interesting twist waiting to be discovered. There's only one way to find out. It's time I pop this game in and see just how deep this rabbit hole goes. Combat. <laughs> Combat's front and center in Alice Escaped, which seems ironic seeing how girly the two protagonists are. Yet, despite their over-the-top femininity, these frilly dressed clad gals have no issue with displacing your skull with your asshole. Usada's the one with the enormous hammer, and Kotara's the one with the chain gun. You can switch between the girls on the fly, they each have their own health bars, and they each control similarly as far as movement. Their attacks, on the other hand, are way different. Usada's your basic melee fighter who likes to get close and personal. She has short ground and air combos and can acquire more attacks as the game progresses. Kotara plays the ranged game with her gun and bombs and comes with a learning curve. Usada's attacks require little commitment. You attack, she swings. It's fast and reliable. Kotara, on the other hand, fires her gun in bursts, meaning she sprays bullets for a set time before she stops. And while she's firing, she slows down significantly and cannot turn around. This led to some incredibly frustrating moments with me firing in the wrong direction and having to wait for her volley to stop before I could turn around and engage the fight proper. But this was all my fault. I'm not going to ding a game for me being an idiot. The gals and their attacks controlled just fine. As far as actually fighting, the game likes to trap you in death matches, also known as locked arenas a la Guacamelee, Vernal Edge, and Cookie Cutter. A bunch of enemies spawn, you take them out, then you can go on your merry way. It's nothing entirely new, but Alice Escaped does rank each of these encounters based on damage you took, combo count, and speed. And based on your rank, you'll be rewarded with blue crystals. Get enough blue crystals, and you'll get a skill point. More on crystals and skill points in the progression section. Combo count's kind of a big deal in Alice Escaped. The higher your combo, the more damage you do. Get hit, your combo breaks, you lose your multiplier, and you gotta start all over. Enemies mostly aren't that big an issue. That is, until they start getting hyper armor and shrug off your attacks. If that's the case, Usada and Kotaro will need to chip away at enemy shields before they can actually do damage. There are specific moves each girl has that does massive damage to shields, so that helps keep the game's combat from getting too mindless. The girls also have super moves that absolutely crush these shields and are a lot of fun. Super moves use up the orange bar wrapping around the girls' faces in the top left corner, so obviously you can't spam these attacks. Each girl has their own super meter that charges as they attack, and this is where the tag team feature comes into play. 
As you progress, you'll unlock tag features that'll help in combat, such as being able to switch characters in midair and removing super meter costs to switch characters. Yes, it costs super meters to switch at first, and yes, it's awful. My favorite is the follow-up ability that allows you to cancel super moves by tagging in the other girl so she can do her super move for massive damage. I'm talking some serious Marvel vs. Capcom shit here, even down to the character splash screen popping up so you know it's fun and super gratifying to pull off, especially when done against bosses. The bosses in Alice Escaped are fine. There's nothing to talk about, really. They've shields you have to shatter before you can do direct damage to their HP, so they're just scaled up basic enemies. They're hardly a challenge and are defeated pretty much as soon as battle starts. It suffice to say the challenge in Alice Escaped doesn't come from its combat, but that doesn't mean combat isn't fun. I enjoyed the two girls' diverse movesets, and the tag mechanic grew into something satisfying and unique for a Metroidvania game. I only have two real complaints about combat. One, you can unlock this up aerial attack for Usada that's complete garbage. Just look at the hitbox on this thing. Ridiculous. Don't unlock this stupid move. It pissed me off the entire game. And two, the death matches respawn, and this is terrible for exploration. In the other games I used as examples earlier, once you complete a locked arena, you never have to fight it again. But in Alice Escaped, you get locked into these fights every time you backtrack through a screen. And let me tell you, it's the most obnoxious thing ever. This obnoxiousness will become more clear in the spoilers section. The combat in Alice Escaped can be summed up in a simple phrase. Easy, yet engaging. I highly doubt any encounter besides the true ending's final boss will give you any trouble. The enemies in 99% of the bosses are complete pushovers, but that doesn't mean they're not fun to trash. Swapping between the two girls and utilizing the tag feature to its fullest can be very satisfying even if the game's default difficulty doesn't really demand you to master any of the game's techniques. But hey, that's why Alice Escaped has difficulty options for the real gamers. Abilities Platforming Abilities and platforming are where Alice Escaped falls flat. Let's begin with abilities. You pretty much start with every ability you need in the game. Wall jump and air dash. Though, you don't technically start with air dash, you have to purchase it off the skill tree. But it's one of the first things you get off the tree, so you might as well start with it. These two abilities the girls start with are part of the holy trinity in Metroidvanias. The double jump, the wall jump, and the air dash. The abilities most envy heroes fight their entire games to acquire. Not these girls. They're practically given two of these skills out the gate. Normally, I wouldn't say getting these abilities so soon is a bad thing. You've heard me bring up the Ori 1 vs 2 example a bunch already, where I argue the earlier you get platforming skills, the better. But that's not the case in Alice Escaped. The platforming and level design on offer here are consistently mediocre throughout the game, so giving players all the traversal abilities up front doesn't do anything to improve the platforming's mediocrity. But the air dash can be used in all directions, so that's neat. Here's the major pitfall for Alice Escaped. The wall jump and air dash are the only abilities the girls get. Yes, Ori 2 gives players these skills early, the air dash being Ori's flippy move, but they also give Ori so many more skills to discover. In Alice Escaped, there are no other abilities to find. So, with every move practically given to you and no new moves to find, does that mean there's no utility-gated exploration, a core tenet of Metroidvania design? Essentially, yeah. Most blocked off areas are only opened once the story's progressed far enough for that area to unlock. There are doors that require you to upgrade your weapons via the game's skill tree before you can destroy them, but these doors only ever lead to side quests or optional items and never bar your story progression. So that raises the question, is Alice Escaped even a Metroidvania? And the answer is, yes, technically. There are at least two spots that require you to use the air dash and double air dash in order to progress. And these skills are technically unlockable via the skill tree. So yes, Alice Escaped is technically a Metroidvania, and by technically, I mean barely. Progression. Progression in Alice Escaped is pretty simple and is actually addicting because it has a positive symbiotic relationship with exploration. Let me explain. Progression is simple because there's not a lot to worry about. No EXP, no leveling, no gear. The closest Alice Escaped gets to EXP are the star rankings you get after completing a deathmatch. Which is kind of a funny sentence to say considering our protagonists are little girls in dresses. Anyway, after a little girl deathmatch, you receive a ranking and are rewarded with blue crystal shards. Once you acquire enough blue crystal shards to fill this meter, you'll be given a large blue crystal, which is essentially a skill point. You can also fill this meter by collecting crystal shards as you explore, or you can just straight up find a large blue crystal while exploring and instantly get a skill point. 
As my handsome and intelligent viewers have no doubt already guessed, skill points are used in a skill tree to unlock a plethora of skills. These skills range from new attacks, to upgrading your weapons, to giving you new skills like the air dash or speech. Yeah, I didn't mention speech in the ability section because I'm not entirely sure what it does or how to assess if it's working or not. I get that you need to persuade characters in the game and there's apparently speech skill checks, but these checks really didn't make sense. Here are two scenarios that require 50% speech, whatever that means. In the first scenario, I failed the check, but in the second, I passed despite not having upgraded the ability since failing the first scenario. I don't know, it's weird and never explained. Moving on, the nodes on the skill tree can only be unlocked with the crystals you've collected and there are three colors of crystals you can find throughout your journey. Blue, green, and red. The latter colors being more scarce. And that's pretty much it for progression. Have your little girls collect shiny crystals and exchange them for bombs and guns in the skill tree. It's pretty much how things work here in America too. Exploration. Exploration was nothing to write home about, mainly because the game's so linear and only offers story-gated progression. The mid to late game does deviate from linearity, but I'll save that for spoilers. All you need to know is Traversing Wonderland starts out fine, but devolves into a tedious slog by mid-game and becomes akin to torture by the end. The game has fast travel between save points, which is awesome, but even that's not enough to alleviate the end game's tedium. So what makes exploration decent at first? Well, the end game map was fine. I liked how detailed the minimap was too, though I think the game relied a little too much on its detailed minimap when it should have been more focused on improving its level design. You literally can't see what's down there even with the minimap. It's bullshit. And this bullshit happens a lot. The biomes were interesting. I mean, it is Wonderland, a very famous fictional world. The devs had a lot of material to work with. And there are a few things to collect. Large crystals for the skill tree, smaller crystals that become large crystals once enough are collected, permanent health upgrades, lots of key items to progress the story, and some NPCs with side quests. So yeah, exploration's as basic as it comes and isn't really rewarding enough. I pretty much knew what I was getting if I went off the beaten path, unlocking a shortcut or getting into a death match for a crystal or something. Exploration becomes more rewarding later, but these are narrative rewards and nothing tangible for your little girls. And surprise, surprise, these narrative rewards are hard to talk about without spoilers. So guess what? I'm saving them for the spoiler section. Atmosphere narrative. Alice Escaped is a bright, vibrant, lighthearted romp through Wonderland filled with a bunch of little anime girls in dresses. There's really not much more I can say about it. You're either gonna be okay with that or give it a pass. Its animation is interesting. It's tough to describe, but I'd say it reminds me a lot like Jello the way everything kind of squishes and wobbles as they move. Overall, I think the aesthetic's pretty unique and works well, especially with the upbeat music. There are actually a few tracks that got stuck in my head after I shut the game down, and that's always a good sign. The enemy design's on point. When you think of Wonderland, you think of mushrooms and bugs and playing cards as guards and just wacky things like penguins with swords or a rabid stack of books or something. To that end, Alice Escaped nails it. And with its cute aesthetic, nothing ever really comes across as threatening. All in all, the atmosphere is pretty fun and memorable. I guess the elephant in the room is whether this game is horny or not. Or, more aptly put, does it over-sexualize the little girls? Personally, I don't think so. The closest the game gets is the close-up shots of the girls when they do their special moves, but I'd hardly say that qualifies as inappropriate. As far as the narrative goes, it's tricky to talk about without touching on spoilers, so I'll quickly give a spoiler-free take on it before we dive into the spoiler section. Alice Escape's narrative is actually deeper and more intriguing than it initially lets on. Starting out as a goofy story about chasing Alice, then evolving into a more involved mystery before veering off in some pretty unexpected directions. It's kind of funny how this cliche story of little girls trying to rescue another little girl turns into something completely different with much higher stakes. It caught me off guard, that's for sure. I think that's why I got so invested in the plot, because it shattered my expectations. Based on the game's whimsical tone and not so serious amateurish dialogue, I was expecting another run-of-the-mill rescue the princess fairy tale. I'm pleased to say Alice Escaped offers much more than just that. <sighs> but it isn't perfect. This is your spoiler warning. Go to this timestamp to fast travel to my final thoughts. Spoilers. Welcome to the spoilers section, where every obscure thing is brought up and the format don't matter. Let's talk about that narrative. 
Turns out Wonderland's an alternate reality wished into existence by a little girl who wanted to escape her reality. And now it's gotten out of control and continues to suck in and trap vulnerable little girls displeased with their realities. And if these girls stay in Wonderland too long, they lose all their memories and forget who they are and where they came from. You discover this when you finally find Alice and learn she wasn't kidnapped and imprisoned. She's stuck in that room of her own volition and doesn't want to leave. She's there to escape her reality for whatever reason, the game never makes this clear. This was really interesting because the game starts out as a rescue mission and then turns into a mystery slash detective game where you have to talk to and uncover things based on NPC dialogue. New information will net new leads toward different outcomes and endings, of which there are five endings in total. One of the first endings reveals the queen hasn't locked Alice up, Alice has locked herself up, and nobody knows where the key is. This is where the detective side of things kicks in. Though it's not a huge or dynamic genre shift or anything. It's not like it turns into Phoenix Rider or Professor Layton. Anyway, you find the key, fight Alice, and then discover your next problem. Even if you could convince Alice to leave with you, you don't actually know how to leave Wonderland. With each ending, you run up against another wall and lead that's meant to guide you on what you should do next to complete the game with the best ending. It's actually fascinating. Here I was thinking I was playing just another cutesy, straightforward Metroidvania, and the next thing I know, I'm trapped in a time loop that's tearing reality apart. Oh yeah, I should probably talk about those other endings before we go completely off the rails. So yeah, as you're retracing your footsteps and interrogating NPCs to discover a way back home, you'll eventually stumble upon the White Rabbit's Watch, an item that allows you to reset the timeline simply by opening up your inventory and activating it. And when I say reset the timeline, I mean start the game all over. Every item replaced on the map, every shortcut undone, every boss returned to their station, every NPC interaction reset as if you've never met. What does this mean? Exactly what you think. You have to replay the entire game every time you activate that watch. Thankfully, all the crystals and heart pieces you've collected and the skills you've unlocked carry over to each timeline. But it does little to assuage the pain and tedium of having to redo and retrace your steps every time you have to reset. Especially when you have to do Dodo's cleaning side quest over and over and over and over and During my playthrough, I probably reset the timeline eight or nine times, so I knew my way around Wonderland by the time the final end credits rolled. There was actually one time I had to reset because I needed one more red crystal to unlock the special fast travel skill you need to stop Alice from getting to the Red Queen's castle, and I had already exhausted all the red crystals in the current timeline. And red crystals, of course, can only be found in the game's final biomes. So I had to replay the entire game again just to get a red crystal so I could unlock a skill, which required me to reset again so I could use the skill to stop Alice before she got to the castle. Granted, had I unlocked the Cheshire Cat's fast travel skill much sooner, I wouldn't have had to reset so much, but I went into this game blind. The way the game's narrative is revealed basically guides you into getting the fast travel skill as one of the last things you do because you have to find the Cheshire Cat's secret hideout and then talk to her three thousand times before she trusts you enough to give you the trinket you need to get the skill, which then requires another reset so you can show the trinket to the Cheshire Cat at an earlier point in time so she'll teach you the skill. Ugh. Even talking about it is exhausting. Imagine actually doing it. And that's Alice Escape's biggest issue. Its surprise time loop mechanic is both its coolest feature and biggest weakness. It's awesome resetting the timeline to manipulate events, but it sucks having to travel the entirety of Wonderland again every time you do it. With death matches and boss fights constantly stopping you in your tracks, and having to reopen shortcuts again and again feels counterintuitive and oxymoronic. I will say, after having to replay through Wonderland nearly 10 times, I was eventually able to zip through the world in about 10 minutes or so. Yet, it was never not obnoxious. So yeah, if you're listening to these spoilers without having played the game, shame on you. At least now you know what you're in for. A repetitive slog of a late game as you search for ways to unlock its endings. But here's the thing. Even though I found the game grating by the end, I never stopped playing. I was genuinely interested to see where things were going next. The narrative especially piqued my interest once I discovered that the White Rabbit has reset the timeline over 30,000 times to stop reality from collapsing onto itself. During this timeline or quest, he recruits you to take out spatial anomalies scattered throughout Wonderland. And this quest culminates in one of the coolest parts of the game. The girls falling into a biome that's not even on the map. Matter of fact, this biome's location would be completely off the map. 
It's a great surprise that comes with an amazing transition. The biome itself is just a prison area with some tough battles, but there's a pervading sense of otherness that makes you feel like you're exploring a space you're not supposed to be exploring. And it's the best feeling any Metroidvania fan can get from Metroidvania. And it ends in an incredibly intriguing way, at the edge of the world where reality is falling apart. The game's come a long way since chasing Alice through a land made out of desserts. I absolutely love it when games take weird turns like this. Anyway, once confronted, the White Rabbit tells you where to find the Mad Hatter's hat that contains her memories. With your new lead, you reset the timeline and start your next adventure again. And I think that's it for spoilers. It's tough to get across in words, but Alice Escape's narrative is equal parts unique, fascinating, and frustrating. Like I said, I was hooked by the absurdness of how a cutesy game about middle school girls in frilly dresses chasing after another little girl turned into a time-looping cautionary tale of existentialism and how a dependence on escapism can lead to alienation. But on the other hand, all that time-looping really, really got on my nerves. I was so freaking sick of Wonderland and its music when all was said and done. Even though I'd say I ultimately had a good time, I don't think I'll be revisiting Wonderland anytime soon. Conclusion. If you can stomach its kawaii aesthetics, Alice Escapes a decent enough 2D action game that's light on platforming and heavy on combat. Its narrative surprisingly good, though the dialogue isn't what I'd describe as gripping. And the way it delivers its narrative is as interesting as it is divisive. There's a mechanic introduced mid-game that refreshingly turns everything on its head, but its novelty soon gives way to tedium and just outright pain. I just can't help to think that it could have been handled much better somehow. Should Metroidvania fans play Alice Escaped? I'm gonna say, unless you're like me and have a mission to play every Metroidvania ever, give this one a hard pass. It's barely even a Metroidvania with its only two instances of ability gating. And the tedium that sets in once the quote unquote detective mode starts is enough to crush the will of even the most steadfast of wayward souls. I'd suggest taking the blue pill on this one, Neo. Though the game certainly has its moments and merits, there's just not enough here to warrant seeing how deep this rabbit hole goes.